The Zulu name for the Drakensberg is Okashamba. The word describes the echo that bounces off the cliffs and sounds like the clashing of spears against shields. It evokes images of Shaka's all-conquering regiments, but also of subsequent colonization. The statue of a Fuhrtracker woman who said she would rather walk barefoot over the mountains than live under British rule can be seen on the eastern ridge of the Berg. It's a remnant of a bygone era, but in some ways time has stood still here. Although the descendants of the Fuhrtrackers now have tractors and 4x4s, in tribal areas oxen are still used for transport and ploughing. Political divisions remain and land is a burning issue. White commercial farmers own lots of it. They are highly productive, farming beef and dairy cattle, wheat, maize and soya beans. There are also vast tracts of tribal land belonging to the Amangwan and the Amazizi traditional authorities. Here, people plant little other than maize with low profit margins. It's overpopulated and emerging farmers struggle to find space for their cattle. I don't know what to say because the government said they would help us but they haven't even tried. All we can do now is hire grazing space from the white farmers. We can't graze on the mountains because there is theft. At least the white farmers are being helpful. Those who have managed to access land often don't know what to do with it. Zondile Tlachwayo received 50 hectares after putting in a land claim. Although he's had the land for three years, he's done little because he doesn't have a tractor or irrigation, nor the confidence to take out a bank loan. So I'm scared to go to the land bank because I'm still young and uh, still new on the field. I can't just go to the bank and put myself into troubles because I haven't got any experience about how to handle the monies and how to run the business. He's even thinking of selling his cattle because of theft. He can't afford security measures to protect his stock. The only assistance he's received is from the humanitarian agency World Vision, which supplied him with a tank and a plow. Sondile Tlachwayo is an ANC member who believes non-delivery here is purely political. The problem is this. Here in Bagbul, there is a local government and uh, there are all the departments. But now, if you want to succeed here, yeah, you have to be a certain political party so that you can get help. The main town of the area is Bergville the seat of the Okashamba local council, dominated by the IFP and led by Mayor Vikizitam Lochwa. The mayor showed us his skills on the council tractor. He took over two years ago when the incumbent mayor crossed to the ANC. But he paints a bleak picture of life here. Our people here are, are, are struggling. You know, there is no job, nothing. We rely on soil as well as tourism. So therefore, uh, we have tried uh, to group people in order to be taught uh, uh, about the agriculture so that we start now. But starting is often in the form of handouts, which aren't sustainable. <laughs> On this occasion, the mayor and his ward councillors gave out seedlings and fertiliser to a group of the party faithful. But too often, crops fail because people don't know how to farm. The soil in Okatlamba is highly acidic and needs tonnes of lime added to it. 
Mayam Lotchwa says he's requested the local Department of Agriculture to lend a hand. As a mayor, I've done my homework. I've requested them to assist us, and they, they did turn up, but uh, a little bit, you know. They don't uh, come in uh, as we want them. At the end of the day, it's all seen as non-delivery, and local people blame their local government. The politicians fight amongst one another, and the government promises us things but does not deliver. In the freehold areas, complaints about local and district government are equally vociferous. Landowners in Rookdale say they are simply ignored by the municipality, which should be identifying their needs. Even the cemetery has run out of space. There is no space to bury anyone now. It's full up. The roads, they don't want uh, to fix our roads, but some other areas, uh, they are fixing the roads. We don't know why. Why? It's, uh, it's a political thing. Because uh, mostly here in Rookdale, it's ANC and there is that um, minor of IFP. So IFP is leading the, the, the local government here. So that's why we can't breathe. I've said to the councillors of Okashamba, let's work together, let's do things together in order to achieve. Because if ANC is pulling that way, IFP is pulling that way, you know, we cannot reach our goal. But together we can reach our goal because we are there to serve the community. The community must come first and our politics must come later. The local government is not listening to me. They don't take my complaints. So what must I do? After the break, the Dacha legacy. It may be impoverished, but the Bergville or Kachlamba area is one of the top Dacha producers of the world. The informal economy of the area is based on the sale of Dacha. The plant simply needs rain and sunshine to flourish, and there's plenty of that around here. Playwright Dumand Lovu is the author of Bergville Stories, a play about the Dacha riots in the 50s. When I was a kid, my aunt used to tell me about 22 people who were hanged by the apartheid government in 1956. I was only two in 1956. But the story stayed with me. They were hanged because there was a fight. Uh, the police had come to raid their Dacha fields and a fight ensued and five policemen were killed. From that time on, it seemed that development simply bypassed Bergville. So the people of Bergville were kind of left on their own to fend for themselves, so to speak. Uh, and because in South Africa there was this funny dichotomy where if white infrastructure was not interested in a particular place, that place didn't develop, uh, the Bergville uh, inhabitants were left to go to the mountains to find a way of living. And Dacha grows easily around here. So people have been left to depend on that. The finest dacha is said to grow in the Mueni Valley, which is where the riots took place. The area falls under the Amangwan Tribal Authority, led by Nkosi Menzi Hlongwan. He's only 24 and has been in the position less than a year. His father, Nkosi Chani Beswe, lies buried close to the Royal Kraal in the Makusini Forest. He was banished in the 80s for violence related to the forced removals of his people to make way for the Woodstock Dam. He was only reinstated as chief in 2002. On the day he was given his certificate for him to go back into uh, the throne, he died. And in the rules of succession, one of his sons had to take over, and his family has chosen uh, Ingosu Menzi to take over, and it is his traditional place where he should be. But there is much criticism of the young leader from elders in the valley. Chani Beswe, his father, had a reputation as a warmonger. He lost the throne because he brought the war to us. Where are we now? He should not have done that as chief of Amangwani. That is why he lost the throne. He could have stopped the war. I can't say the sun will rule well 
because I have seen no proof of that. He is young and confused. He needs wise men who know about our culture to strengthen his kingdom. He may be young and surrounded by young men, but Nkosi Menzi has the support of the ANC government and seems to be focused on development. I'm trying a lot of things. Even hooking up with ministers to see how to change things around here. Um, so as to uplift the community. But politics in this area brings tears to everyone's eyes. It's a headache. See, in this area, there are only three or four toilets that have been delivered by the municipality. As a result, people relieve themselves in the rivers. Next thing you know, we will have cholera and other funny diseases. Sometimes you have to produce an IFP membership card before you can get a toilet. No card, no toilet. That's why I say politics here is poor. And the local municipality does not want to work with me, being king of the nation. That's why progress is so slow. As you can see, no electricity, no water, we drink with the cows. There is a lot we could do here. I am working with the deputy president to try to correct the situation. Deputy President Pumzile Mlambo Nguka visited Nkosi Menzi last year and has promised to aid development in this area. The IFP mayor says his council is trying its best with limited revenue. We are busy with electricity throughout Ukashamba now. Throughout Ukashamba, municipality, electricity is there. Uh, the places where there is no electricity as well. Uh, we have got maps now and plans in order to install electricity. There is more development in the other tribal authority, belonging to the Amazizi, which is a much smaller area. It's close to several tourist resorts, so there's also employment. Shadrach Gambu works at one of them, but dreams of a different life. Oh, Mr. I would like to, to, to become a farmer. He's a traditionalist and has a house on a piece of land he got from his chief. If you want to learn, you must go to the chief, you must, you must approach the chief. The chief will, will, will charge you the money, about 500 rand for the, for this, for the land. See. So you pay the money, and you must buy some kind of Zulu PR. Many dismiss the tribal system as outdated and undemocratic. But unless there's effective local government, it will remain the anchor of these communities. Amazizi tribal councillor Godfrey Mia says people don't even want to vote anymore. People want to see the development and they know what they are voting for. Uh, at the present moment, they say, yes, we have voted, but what is the use of voting for these elections? Where are they help, helping us? If there's no changes, no, no vote. I'm not going to vote. I'm going to sit down and or to work on to something on my, my own, because there's no development at all. Shadrach's employer, Anthony Cart, has lived here all his life and runs an upmarket resort. He's concerned about the land in tribal areas. The Drakensberg is a world heritage site and should be preserved. Instead, it's being eroded and denuded. You know what we need in this area is some government. We need somebody with a plan, a, a scientifically based plan to come in and, and decide how the land should be utilized in order to protect it and also to be a benefit to the people. So that is the problem, is the plan. There is no plan. 
I, I don't see enough local government. I mean, since I started this lodge here, nobody's ever come to check on my water to see if it's healthy. They've, they've never been to see that if am I polluting these rivers. And the other problem is they have hundreds of thousands of people under the authority of a chief. He has no hope in trying to provide projects for that number of people. It, it's just too big a job. And um, the people have given up on it. I mean, they've never seen a successful project in all these years. I don't know of a single project that has been initiated by the chiefs that, that shows any results over there. And, and the, the, there's a growing hopelessness amongst the people, which is incredibly worrying. Young people in particular are despondent. There are no training centers or sports facilities or libraries. If you go somewhere, some other areas, you see development taking place, but this place... What about us? What about us? Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Cindy Yonker, who owns a bush camp, is trying to help people start their own projects. She was involved in setting up one of the few success stories of the area, the Mweni Cultural Village, financed by Rand Water. But there's just so much private individuals can do. My charitable time gets less and less and less and less, so the heart is so willing, you want to help, but you just can't afford to because eventually it starts eating into your finances. Every trip that you go over there to attend a meeting, it's not being paid for. I think of Elijah, the, the local community guide that I work with very closely. I mean, I helped him with some of his training, and through KZN Wildlife, they've helped him become assessed. But uh, he certainly doesn't feel the support of local governments. I'm Mr. Tara. Sometimes I can say hello instead of hello. And about four years ago, I met a lady called the Cindy Younger, the one who is now owning her camp called Sumbala Mountain Camp. She's the one maybe who helped me a lot, like to encourage me, never be nervous, always maybe be proud of yourself. And so like to, today I, I can say she's the one who took maybe who put me through from down to something today. Today I'm like this because of her. And our government is promising to do maybe more and more for us, but now we are, we, we are still waiting. Maybe nothing yet observed. The mayor says the council has plans to train people. <laughs> we have got 13 wards here to Kashanga. As municipality, we, we have put aside the sum of uh, 130,000 in order to train people from these 13 wards. Each ward will be allocated with 10,000. <laughs> The role expected from local government in these remote rural areas is vast and almost impossible to fulfill. The bigger the machinery, the tougher it is to bring about change. And government has huge bureaucracy and it has huge leadership change. And to change a bureaucratic system that goes from local government to provincial government to national government and bring about organizational change that leads to delivery. It's a long-term process. After the break, a farmer's dream. <laughs> Ivan Schuler has farmed all his adult life and is passionate about the land and its people. Like many white farmers around here, he speaks Zulu. But unlike many, he has no qualms about actively participating in Zulu life. He does contract ploughing in tribal areas and is overwhelmed by requests for assistance and advice. He tries to explain the damage overgrazing and incorrect ploughing can do to the land. But no one's listening. They use one road. And then as it erodes, they just put an extra road next to it. Here we've got about 30 metres area, which is 30 metres wide erosion, just by moving roads from one side to the other side. When it rains, topsoil pours off the hillsides into rivers and streams in this vital catchment area. Well, eventually we'll have a big hole, no soil, and everything will be sitting in the rivers and in the sea. There are efforts to repair erosion, but no one seems to be teaching people methods to prevent further damage. 
Less than a kilometer from this Donga reclamation project, the land has been plowed without contours. When it rains, the water will run straight through cultivated earth and cause more erosion. I talked to Ivan that they must come and teach our farmers here uh, about the plantation of any kind and to do the crop rotation as well. Ivan Shula's dream is to start an agricultural training school on communal land along the Lambonja River, a tributary of the Tugela. But of course there are no funds. While he waits for his dream to be realized, he moves about the district, lending a hand where he can. <laughs> He wishes people would plant less maize and concentrate on crops that could bring in a higher income or give them better nutrition. Well, the, my dream would be to train them to go more than just the maize, where they'd go dry beans, chickens, lay, broiler chickens, laying hens, potatoes. He's approached a seed company, which could help farmers plant crops like millet and rye grass. What would essentially happen is we would, together with them, plant it. They would have grazing for their cattle through the winter on lush ryegrass. And then in about September, October, early October, we'll shut it off and it would develop seed. And the spin-off from that is that they'll get an, a cash income from it. And our spin-off is that we'll, we'll have good quality seed, but it's not as simple as that. There's a lot of management involved and we'd have to be very much involved with them. Involvement is the key to success. World Vision has helped this group in the Emmaus area make a go of farming crops other than maize. Although the cooperative called Sakisizwe, or Building the Nation, is doing well, the members also have bigger dreams. It is the strength and energy we put into it that is helping our plants grow. But there is no money or enough resources to grow our business. If we had some sort of financial assistance, we could have more farms like this in other parts of this district. People here have dreams. And for me, that's the exciting part, is to find out what those dreams are, help engage with them, see what they need to realize those dreams, and yeah, so the biggest frustration is, is that we don't have enough resources and skilled people who can help develop the community, help develop people to realize their dreams. <laughs>